kind of ties into the methods and it also relates to the periodization uh, scheme that we talked about before. So here we see the force velocity curve. Sorry, the some of the wording isn't as clear as it could be, but um, what we see is the dotted line down here is your classic force velocity curve uh, based on uh, A.B. Hill's research uh, in which he took uh, muscles and then uh, made them contract and took a look at how much uh, force a muscle could produce when contracting at a specific velocity. Um, and what we see up here, the top curve, this is uh, Pavo Comey's force velocity curve based on his research, uh, which is much more uh, recent and contemporary. And basically, uh, and this was the, the Hill force velocity curve is still what's in all of the textbooks. And so all of you that have been certified, we all are familiar with this. And what we see in the force velocity curve is at 50% of your one rep max, we produce maximal power output. So it would be a power curve going right up in this area. Um, and there's uh, quite a few problems with uh, Hill's Hill's work and uh, also the power curve that goes along with it. Um, first of all, the force velocity curve um, that that Hill used uh, did not take into account that the uh, stretch shortening cycle, so the elastic tissues of the property and the stretch reflex, so the muscle spindles and all that good stuff, uh, which as we know is the basis for example of plyometrics you step off a box you land on the ground your body produces thousands of pounds of force uh, which is far more than you can squat volitionally or even hold in place which would be this point on the force velocity curve uh, because force is mass times acceleration and you know you step off a three-foot box there's a ton of acceleration there so um, because it doesn't take into account things like the stretch reflex and the elastic qualities of the of the muscle tissue, uh, it works great in a laboratory setting, but unfortunately in the real world, or for us fortunately as strength coaches and performance coaches, um, we have these things that we can exploit, the stretch shortening cycle, the stretch reflex. Um, so Comey looking at the research was like, well, this is all fine and dandy, but let's take a look at uh, some force velocity curves that take into account the stretch shortening cycle. And so he put, uh, I want to say, a fiber optic uh, cable into the uh, gastrocnemius, and uh, he essentially uh, had people do various movements, and his research comes up with this alternate force velocity curve, which tends to make more sense. Um, we know, like I said, through plyometrics and things like that, that we can produce large amounts of force um, with uh, at very, very high velocities. So, uh, with this, oh, the other problem that I wanted to talk about was the power curve, which is not on here, and I don't have a slide of it, but most of you know it's an inverted U. Like I said before, that runs right around here, and we see the highest power outputs at about 50% of uh, voluntary effort. And the problem with the power curve is essentially it's based on mathematics. So if we take Hill's version of the force velocity curve at face value, and we know that power is force times velocity, then obviously we know down here where velocity is high, force is low, so the product of those two numbers is going to be lower. So if we had a velocity of 100 and a force of 1, our net f at this point uh, on our power output, the net would be 100. Same thing here. If we have 100 force, 1 velocity, the net, is a, the net would be 100. So those would be the starting and ending points of our power curve. And then right around 50%, if we have a 50 force and a 50 velocity, 
that gives us 2500 for power output because it's basically 50 times 50. So that's how this inverted U comes about that we see that overlays the force velocity curve. In this, um, therein lies, you know, another problem. Obviously, it's based off of the simple fact that, uh, you know, the, the, the idea that you cannot produce high force at high velocity, which obviously Comey's research shows that we, do, that we can. Um, and when we look at this, and I kind of got a little bit of this from uh, Cal Dietz at the University of Minnesota. Um, he, we can definitely see two distinct components of, of Comey's uh, chart. Uh, we see these high force movements that are all in this black area, and then we see movements that transition very rapidly right here to high velocity movements. So where the slope, where the slope here is pretty flat, and this is kind of the way I'd been breaking it up um, Cal has uh, his excellent book out there that, that's wonderful that goes into some of this too. And I really like the book because it actually kind of really mirrors kind of what I like to do with athletes as well. Um, but he sees this line right here, and so do I, as uh, your maximal strength training. So we're producing a lot of force, but the velocity is, for the most part, pretty low. Where the slope starts to increase right through here we're still producing high amounts of force but now we're moving at moderate to high velocities so he calls this a high force high velocity phase i'm you know a fan of keeping things a little more simple so i usually just refer to the this part of the curve right here is your maximal strength this part is our maximal power and this last part is our velocity or peaking phase because when we're moving in sport we need to move at really really high velocities we don't have a hundred pound barbell or 400 pound barbell on our backs uh, or you know no one slides a bench press onto the football field and says bench this and then let's go uh, play it down and see how things go so we need to move at very very high velocities with very little external load so we get the th the three components that I talked about in the previous discussion about periodization. We have our maximal strength, our power, and then our peaking. So maximal strength, and we'll get into loading parameters a little more a little bit later, you know, generally 85, 80, 85 to 100 percent of one rep max. Uh, the max power, generally I like to kind of stay uh, anywhere from 50 to 75 percent. Those are percents that are also utilized in uh, Mark Ripito's excellent book, Practical Programming. Um, Cal Deeds likes to go up to 80%, but so anywhere in that 50 to 75% range, that's going to be this this high force, high velocity kind of stuff. Your power, your max, uh, your power phase in my verbiage. And then finally, we have high velocity unweighted movements. That would be anything under 50% uh, of your one rep max. Generally. I like to kind of stay away from this little transition here and kind of stay more in the the 40% range maybe. And for those of you who are familiar with the old Inno Sports speak um, with uh, uh, let's see what did he have duration magnitude and 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 um, rate work. Uh, you know, despite his weird use of language, uh, duration works here, magnitude work is in this area, and then rate work is here. So we have max strength or duration, we have power or magnitude, and then we have rate or velocity or peaking. So when you look back, if you decide to look back at or download the slides from the previous discussion, and you see me using a uh, a strength phase, a power phase, or a peaking or velocity or speed phase. Um, these are the areas of the force velocity curve that we're working along in order to accomplish those goals. So in summary, the force velocity curve, Hill, Hill uh, kind of came up with the original force velocity curve and sadly it does not account for the uh, stress shortening cycle. 
humans as we locomote we use the stretch shortening cycle we use stretch reflex we use the elastic abilities of our connective tissues um, my master's thesis was on running economy and using those elastic properties is what running economy is all about um, and when we look at the force velocity curve with um, the stretch uh, uh, shortening cycle taken into account or stretch shortening cycle taken into account with uh, Comey's research we see um, two to three main zones you could if you wanted to really just keep it super simple max strength and power and the power phase uh, that top half of the force velocity curve with the dark line um, you know you could lump those together and then just have a velocity and peaking phase uh, I like to kind of separate them out a little bit so we have max strength uh, we go through a power phase and then a high velocity or peaking phase so that's kind of where those phases came from and that's kind of how when we look at the methods and the way that we program the movements because remember we talked about movements before and they were uh, you know four basic kind of movement patterns we you know, and pretty much anything we do in my mind can kind of fit into those those basic movement patterns now we're gonna look at those movement patterns keeping this force velocity curve in the back of our brain and we're gonna look at the methods and you know, the way we can program them uh, all the way along the force velocity curve so that way when we're in a specific phase we know what we can do to maximize our efforts uh, and we can also apply the concept of concentrated loading to make sure we're not kinda of mixing things in too much um, so those are some of the things we're going to look at in the future, and that's where we are going. Thank you.